Let's see, would someone get the lights, please, for me? I'd appreciate it. Thank you very much. There's always something. There we go. You know, after Joe's wonderful sermon on the the individuals of snowflakes and God's power, and wow, what a wonderful sermon. And then, Tim, you did such a great sermon on uh, Jesus after 12. It was just an awesome sermon. And then I get to... This better work. There it goes. I wanted to talk uh, about the gifts we get. You know, most sermons would be on uh, New Year's Eve, uh, on your resolutions. Well, I really wanted to think about, you know, I appreciate so much what you said uh, before we had partook of the Lord's Supper about Jesus and what He knew was going on. And then I thought, you know, uh, growing up, one of the most precious gifts I could get was a BB gun, <laughs> and I'd wear it out. You know, we lived on a farm, and, and I'd wear it out every year. But have you ever thought about God's precious gift that He gave us? And I'd like to spend just a little bit of time on that this morning. And I'm going to be mad if this is not going to work. There it goes. Okay, God's precious gift. Let me see if this is turned on. Well, it is. So much for, you can always use the old finger, can't you? John 3.16, we all know the Scripture uh, by heart. And for God so loved the world that He gave His only, only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And as you think of this, I'd just like to focus on a, a phrase in this paragraph. He gave His only begotten Son. Uh, some of us, well, a lot of you and have one son. And I can't imagine giving my son up like God did. He, you know what He suffered, but He so loved us. And I, that little word, so, can mean so much. God's precious gift. This is the best gift of all. all. He gave Jesus. And if you think about it and think outside the box, he, he did not sell him, he didn't loan him, and he didn't rent him. It's just amazing. He gave Jesus before man could ever even think of such a thing. And it's just, it's just it's not in my box to think of those things. He saw what we were. We were all sinners. And what we needed, well, we needed the commitment that He made to us. And He gave that commitment by giving His only Son. God's precious gift, as you think about, the Apostle Paul wrote to help us understand a little bit what it means in Romans 5, 8. But God commendeth His love toward us in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Just think of those words, please. Christ died for us. And we were sinners. We're all sinners. We know the Bible tells us that he who says he has no sin is a liar, and the truth is not in him. He gave us his very best. How much does God value us? Many times, I don't think we really think about how much God, what God thinks we're worth. John seventeen twenty two through 23. Beautiful. And they that may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that we may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. That's quite a bit to unpack, but it is so beautiful. Love them, the important key in 
that particular thing, and that you have loved me. I don't think we think God can love us a lot. I know I don't. Jesus asked two questions. Matthew 16, 26. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? If he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul, we see through life very wealthy men and women who are very wealthy and they come to the end of time and it's pretty sad if they're not Christians. Jesus with his two questions continued with what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. I didn't mean to go backwards. I am so sorry with this thing I can't go backwards. It just worked. Okay. So what shall a man give in exchange for his own soul? Is it going forward? The word of healing, or shall a man give up? In exchange? It's going. Okay, now it's going to work. Uh, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? <coughs> he gave his very best. I I know you see this in sports. You see it in everything to give your very best. But Peter revealed the cost. I think in the reading this morning with Tim, you see where Peter ended up, you know, becoming Satan, so to speak. But Peter in 1, 18 through 19, for as much as you know, you were not redeemed with corruptible things, such as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Focus on silver and gold. I know there's a lot of, uh, uh, there are a lot of ads that you see today that you, uh, you know, save silver and gold. That part of it seems pretty good. But when the end of time comes, you know, it's going to be that precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without a spot. And, uh, you know, it's not saying you shouldn't save gold and silver, but just don't depend on that as the only thing. Tim, I didn't want to get into your world. for so. <laughs> yeah, Investments are wonderful. He gave me his very best, though. Keep that in your mind. And you are not cheap or worthless in God's eyes. That's the point, really, that I'm trying to make here. And no matter who you are or what you have done, and I know that we have seen people have done what they think is unforgivable things. And isn't it wonderful that God can forgive us? Because God loves us. He loves you and has given his best for you. You can be saved and go to heaven. That's especially good news, too. Christ, not man, will tell you how. He gave... Uh, <clears throat> He gave because we need him. Man has a very difficult time thinking like God thinks, seeing as God sees, and understanding what God understands. You know, we can think about those little snowflakes or anything. God, look at a little insect and the details in its, uh, just animals everywhere. Roman tells me, uh, tells us, of course, that uh, we can't, be an unbeliever, uh, an atheist, if we really look at God's universe. He, understand, he understands us. He knows us because, again, He made us. God knows how much we need Him. He gave because we need Him continued. Many don't realize just how much they need God. We need God's physical blessings, the air, the water, the food, the clothing, shelter, etc. I don't know about the NFL, Scott, but that was a good one, too. <laughs> In class this morning, it was a good one. Physical blessings. How much do we have? Everything in this country. And I appreciate it. I know sometimes we take it for granted. But, you know, when the, all of a sudden the water doesn't work or something, we realize that 
God's in control really of all of that. But we need God's spiritual blessing, His grace, His guidance, and His help. I love the suit tells me a lot of, of times, kind of the, I don't know if it's your motto or what that your group has, but it's God is always able to help me with that. God's big enough to handle our problems. Is, is that my version? God is bigger than our oh, bigger than our problem. Okay, well, anyway, I, uh, I think you've done a wonderful thing for the new year. He is wonderful to help us with our blessings, our spiritual blessings. We need God emotionally. Hope. What would our world be without hope? Have you ever been in a family or in a situation where there was no peace? It makes you really appreciate peace and love. What is love all about? You know, love is, of course, there are different types of love. There, you know, uh, the Greeks developed it into four ways, but it, uh, I hope you don't mind me mentioning this, but Colton and what is his wife's name? Megan? Makenna. Makenna. Makenna, thank you. Isn't that an example of love, a new love and, and, uh, I'm not going to talk about 60 years of love, but it's been wonderful. There are ups and downs, but love is, is wonderful. He gave because we are often told to be independent. Now, have any of you heard this? Trust no one or be your own person. I hear that a lot, and I, I, I don't hear it in the church, but I, I remember a story of a a father who asked his young son to d jump off the counter. The son was about five years old. The son jumped, and the father stepped back, and the kid busted his nose on the floor. And he said, son, remember that. Don't trust anybody. Isn't that the kind of dad you want? <laughs> no. But anyway, trust no one. Ooh, I'm glad I had my parents I had. Oops. Some have taken it to me that we don't need God. Well, yes, we do. I think it was Eisenhower that said there are no atheists in foxholes, and I can see why. Many go through life without him to regret their decisions forever. Jesus' letter to the church in Laodicea, Laodicea Revelations 3, 20 through 21, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him, and he with me. To him that overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. I don't know. Do you, that is the best invitation you could have in your life. I will come in to him. Imagine, well, the king of kings will come to us. Luke also gives us some thought. Uh, chapter 15, verse 12 through 32. The prodigal work, woke up in a pig pen and found he needed to come home. I'm just curious, how many of you have ever been in a pig pen? Oh, you do not know what you've missed. I had, we had pigs growing up, and I had to feed those pigs. <laughs> and they're, they're extremely brilliant but they are extremely dirty too so unless it's a pet I don't they're pets nowadays but he was eating what the pigs didn't eat he came to himself he said how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger he had to be hungry to eat what the pigs didn't I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him father I have sinned against heaven and therefore thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Please, uh, there's not a please in there, but make me as one of thy hired her, uh, servants. The prodigal woke up in a pig pen and found he needed to go to uh, go home into God. In Luke 12:16 through 21, a rich farmer was going to build a greater barn or greater barns, but he learned his soul belonged to God. I'm sure you remember the story. It's in Luke. But he said, This I will do. I will pull down my barns and build greater barns. And I don't, if this is why this thing really helps me. And you notice I hit the wrong button. And let me get backwards now. 
Will I bestow all my fruits and my goods? And then I will say to my soul, So you have made goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, You fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose shall these things be which you have provided? Rich farmer, as we just looked at, was going to build greater barns, but he learned that his soul belonged to God. He gave his love to change us. And I think we're all changeable. In Ephesians 2, 4 through 5, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive with Christ. He gave his love to change us through the cross. The cross has a a unique and wonderful power over our lives. Time of pride, it humbles us. It humbles one person. Time of guilt, when you see the cross, you think of forgiveness. Time of anger, the cross can remind you of patience. Time of fear, it reassures us. Time of worry, the cross gives us hope. Romans eight thirty one through 32. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who? And I'm going to repeat that. Who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not be with also freely give us all things? He that spared not his own son will do what? Be right by our side. He delivered him up for all of us as we just partook of the Lord's Supper. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15. For the, for the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but again unto him which died for them, he rose again. Hallelujah. Uh, this is the thing about electrical things. Sometimes they don't want to electric size with my fingers. For the love of Christ constrains us because we thus judge. And if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which should live should not henceforth live to themselves, but unto him which died for them rose again. I know I'm repeating that, but I've just got to doesn't hurt to repeat that I guess God knew the best way to reach and bring about change in the lives of people was by how loving them he loves us and we should love out John 3 16 well there it is again for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. Matthew seven thirteen through 14. Enter you at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go through it. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, There'll be few that find that. Broad is the way to hell. Narrow is the way to heaven, to put it bluntly. You can see the narrow way and the broad way. 
to travel the narrow way, we have to do something. Nothing, of course, is what you need to do if you want to go the broad way. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7, 9 kind of focuses our thoughts now that and to you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ who will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power the narrow way, the broad way. To travel the narrow way, again, we have to do something. Nothing to travel the broad way. Matthew 7, 13 through 14 tells us what we need to do to get to heaven. Or do nothing to get to hell. John twelve forty eight. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words has one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. What must one do to walk the narrow way, to get to heaven? All must obey the gospel of Christ. We learn to hear the word of course in Romans ten seventeen. Of course, once you hear it, you have to believe it. Hebrews eleven six. Once you believe it, you need to repent, be sorry of your sins. Luke thirteen three. You must also confess your sins. Acts eight thirty seven thirty six and thirty seven. And of course, be baptized. Acts two thirty eight and forty through forty seven. And remain faithful, Revelations 2.10. The precious gift we have gotten for Christmas and to really think about at the beginning of this new year is Jesus. Jesus is our gift and what a precious gift. And the whole church said, Amen. Christ did this for you and for me. I gave my life for you. My precious blood I shed. Will you take advantage of God's gift today by obeying Him? If there are any of you that need to be, would like to be baptized, we have those facilities. Or if you need the prayers of the church, we could always come forward or write on that little slip that... Uh, Andrew was talking about, or talk to us privately. We have Tim and, let's see, Dale, uh, our, our elders, not elders, our deacons, and, uh, well, anyone here that would be glad to help you with your prayers. Let me turn this off. Can you get the